Good morning, Life Connection Church. Welcome to church. Let's stand, let's worship the Lord because he is worthy of worship today. the 11 o'clock service. I'm excited about it. You guys got a little extra sleep. But it's cold outside still, right? <laughs> it's a little warmer. Do me a favor. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Father, God, we want to thank you for every breath that we have, 
every breath that we breathe, Lord. God, I pray that we are grateful people and we remember to be grateful to you because you've given us everything. And Lord, you have ordered our days and you have good plans for us, Father. And you've given us gifts to bless the church, to bless the body, and to bless the world. Lord, I pray blessing over everybody here for every situation that, that you would speak to, God. And Lord, I pray for every, every mountain that's in our lives, God, that we remember that you are the one who has saved us, God, on that hill of Calvary. We remember that you have saved us. And God, that mountain that seems immovable is moved by our faith. And we thank you, God, for faith. May we bless you this morning. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Together, walking around these walls. Walking around these walls. I thought by now they'd fall. But you never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come. Waiting for change to come. Knowing the battle's won, for you never failed me yet. Every voice, your promise still stands. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still. comfortable, let's lift our hands to the Lord as we declare that He is all. I know the night won't last. Your word will come to pass. My heart will sing your praise again. Jesus
Friends, we're in a new year, and this means new vision, new life. And as we sing this song, just put to death all the things, the bad things of this old life, and looking away from the things that are behind, and pressing forward to the goodness that God has for us, because he's not done with you. Amen? Amen. Sing together. I was buried. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met you.
y'all take a seat. Well, good morning. I'm glad you're here this morning. Are you glad you're here this morning? All right, good. Well, Happy New Year. Glad to be back again with you today. My name is Billy Taylor, and I've been here before. Most of you I've known. If we've not met, I'm glad to, uh, to be with you. Thank you for being here. Royal is out this week on vacation. He'll be back next week. So they brought in the second team to kind of fill in the gap. So hopefully, I, hopefully I'll keep things awake, keep things moving. Uh, Royal and I have known each other for uh, an eternity and have been good friends. He serves on the board of my ministry, and so uh, uh, I'm always glad to be with you. This seems, kind of feels like my second church. I've kind of seen y'all grow up from, from meeting in, a, uh, in another church to another building to another building, to having your own building, to, be, to expanding your building. So I'm so proud of all that God's been doing. Let me ask you a question this morning. If prayer is so important, why is it so hard? If prayer is so important, why is it so hard? If you're like me, I struggle with prayer at times. Now, let me put that in context. I've been a pastor. I've been a worship leader. I have been in ministry for most of my life. been a Christian since I was 16 years old. And I teach about prayer. My ministry is teaching people how to pray. And yet I struggle with prayer. Do you, do you guys struggle with your prayer life? A very few, very few people who would say, man, I have got prayer tuned in, and man, I just feel like it's really working. And I won't raise your hand, but how many of you this morning, you know, would say, boy, I need some improvement. I need some, some help in my prayer life. If it's so important, why is it so hard? I read recently that the average Christian spends between three and seven minutes a day in prayer. And to be honest, I think that's a lie. I think it's closer to three to seven minutes a week in prayer. But who wants to write that down, right? Because when it comes to prayer, most of us talk a whole lot more than we actually do, right? Mark Twain said, uh, everybody talks about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. When it comes to prayer, we're kind of the same way, right? We talk with someone and they tell us something and what do we say? We say, I will pray for you. How often does that actually happen? In fact, it's kind of one of those phrases that we use. It's very popular in our area now to say, you know, have a blessed day or I'm blessed. Those are just kind of phrases we use. And we, we say, I'll pray for you or I'm praying, I'll pray about that. As a pastor for many years, there, I, I realized that when you ask someone to do something and they say, well, let me pray about that. You know what that means, don't you? It means No. They just didn't want to tell you that. Well, I won't, let me pray about it. But I've never had anyone come back and go, you know, I prayed about that. And my answer is yes. It's always, well, I just think when it comes to prayer, we can all use some, some help. And I want us to, to talk this morning about this, this idea of how do we get past making prayer so hard. I got about five things I want to share with you. But, but before you do, uh, before we do, let me, just, let me just tell you some of the reasons I think we struggle. One is we as pastors have made it harder on everybody. Uh, we, we've done some things that make it hard. One is that we've raised this a really high standard. I don't know if you, but I've heard preachers talk about how many hours they spend in prayer. I, when I was young, I read a book called Praying Hide, which is an incredible book about prayer and about the life of a missionary in India about 100 years ago. He would spend four to five hours a day in prayer. That's a pretty high standard. I don't know about you. That's a pretty high standard. Uh, a few years ago, there was a guy who uh, had a ministry about teaching people how to pray for an hour a day, and it was based off of the Mark 14 where Jesus said, could you not pray for one hour? That's still, for a lot of us, that's difficult. Uh, I hear guys say, well, you know, I get up at 3.30 every morning and spend an hour with God. My thought is, you're infringing on the people in China's time frame. Because at four in the morning, they should have an un, uh, uninterrupted time with God. I should get it about nine o'clock, you know, that, that's where I am. And believe me, 
uh, if I close my eyes at four in the morning, I am going back to sleep. That's just the way I am, just kind of that way, right? So, so it, it's difficult for us to, to get our act together when it comes to prayer because uh, we as preachers have made it hard. We've, we've made it guilt-ridden. If you're not doing this and this and this and this in prayer, then, then you're not up to the standard. Even some of the tools that we have are complicated. A few years ago, I bought a little notebook on how to spend 30 minutes a day with God. It was a notebook, and it had homework. And I had to find out, like, what my congressman's name was and the representative person's name was so I could pray for it. had all this stuff I had to do. And, and the worst part, that was the light version because they had one for praying an hour. And let me just tell you, it's on the shelf, but I've never done anything with it. I just couldn't get through all the stuff. Why would it have to be that complicated? We as pastors have made it guilt-ridden, uh, if you're not doing this and this and this in prayer, we've made it complicated. But how do we get past it? How do, how do we move forward where we understand that it is important and it doesn't have to be that hard? That's what we want to focus on this morning. I want to give you about five things to kind of talk about when it comes to improving your prayer life. But let me, let me tell you a couple of my struggles. I wrote down, here are some of the things that I struggle with when it comes to prayer. See if you can relate to any of those. One of mine is I get distracted when I pray. Does anybody fit into that category? In fact, when I close my eyes to pray, I can almost immediately think of something I'm supposed to be doing. Anybody fall into that category? I mean, it's like I close my eyes and I think, oh, I'm supposed to put those clothes in the dryer for Tammy. Or, oh, I, in fact, I think I could fill out my whole to-do list just by closing my eyes to pray, Right? Are you that way? All this stuff just comes flooding in my mind, and, and, and I don't know how to deal with it. I, I, I've, I've even thought about, it. maybe I should just keep a notepad by me when I pray, and then when those come in, I could just write them down and move on. So distraction is a big one for me. Um, uh, guys, most of us are ADD, right? And it doesn't take much for us to skip a groove and move over to something else. One of the other issues I have is I can't focus my mind when I pray. Does that ever happen to you? You know, I start off praying, and then it just seems to drift away. I say, you know, Lord, thank you for, our, for, for my relationship with my wife, Tammy, and thank you for our home. Thank, thank you, Lord, thank you. We, have, we just enjoy our home so much. And thank, you know, I need to clean out the fire. I need to clean out the fireplace. It, it really is dirty. And in fact, really, you know what? I need to think, I need to remember to buy some wood for the fireplace. We're getting kind of low. And, you know, really... Thinking about that, I, I, need to, I need to find a good place in the backyard to store wood for our fireplace. And, and really, I, need to, I, need to, I, I should build something to cover that so it doesn't get wet. Per, ten minutes later, I'm way over here, right? Does that ever happen to y'all? Yeah, we, we get distracted. We, get, we drift off in our prayer to do other things. Sometimes I don't know what to say or I run out of things to say. Uh, ever ever tried to pray for extended amount of time? I remember one time when I was younger, I had made this commitment to pray 15 minutes. And so, man, I, I got, got on my knees. I closed my eyes. I started praying. I prayed for this and that. I prayed for everybody I knew. I prayed for the missionaries in other countries. I prayed for the president. prayed for everything. I, it's like four minutes had passed, right? And then you're like, hmm, okay, God, I'm still here. Just not sure what I'm supposed to do next. Another one is, and I hate to admit it, but sometimes I just forget. You know, I intended to, but the end of the day came and went, and I never really spent any time with God. I, I, mean, I had good intentions. I just had really bad uh, follow-through. Another one I have struggled with is sometimes it just feels weird. Now, again, I've been in ministry most of my life. I've been a pastor. I went to a, to, to, I went to a Baptist university. I've done all the Bible study, but sometimes, you know, when you pray, it just feels, you start thinking, man, is God listening? Do, do, am I getting past the roof here? Is this just a, a waste of time? It just feels kind of kind of weird at times. Maybe that's just me. Maybe that's just me. But maybe you struggle with it too. Another one, here's a big one for me, <laughs> and I hate to admit it again, sometimes I fall asleep. You know, I'm one of those guys, I bow my head to pray, and I wake up, 45 minutes later, I think, man, I prayed for 45 minutes. I slept for 44 minutes and prayed for one minute, right? I remember when I was in college, I, uh, 
I was living with a pastor in the area. He, he used to take ministerial students and let them live with him the last year of college and really taught them how to walk with God and, and taught them about ministry just by living with them and seeing how it lived out in their life. But he had a 6 a.m. prayer meeting at his house every morning. Now, as a college student I, and as someone who lived in his house, I felt rather committed to be going to that 6 o'clock prayer meeting. But 6 o'clock is early for a college student, Right? I mean, it's early. And uh, about two weeks into that process, he, uh, he said, listen, Billy, I think what you need to do is just stay in bed. He said, because you're coming into the living room and then going to sleep, and so it might be easier just to stay in bed <laughs> instead of and to coming out. Because sometimes I just get sleepy. I'm one of those people that, guys, some of y'all, maybe girls too, you can relate to me. I'm an on or off person. Uh, if I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, I've got to go from 0 to 100. If I sleep until 10 o'clock, it's 0 to 100. Uh, but when I go to bed at night, if you have something to say to me, it needs to be before my head hits the pillow, right? And I'll admit this, it's so bad that when Tammy and I were young, we, were, we decided we would pray, you know, laying in bed, pray together. Doesn't that sound spiritual? And so we decided we would do that. And so she prayed, and then I started praying. And so I'm like, God, we just bless you. We praise you. And, and I paused for a moment, and she's like, it's something spiritual. I mean, he's got this really word from God, you know. You know what happened, right? I went to sleep in my own prayer while I was praying aloud. And so sometimes I just fall asleep. It, it's hard for me to keep my attention. I don't know what your struggle is, but I know all of us have some struggles that we, that we go through when it comes to, to prayer. But I do know this. I believe as a believer, as someone who's given their heart to the Lord Jesus, as a Christian, I believe God has put in our heart a desire, a longing to really know him and to know him in prayer. We may not be very good at it. We may not understand it. We not, may not do it very well. But there's a yearning for us to be good at praying. Because we know that prayer is the center focus of our Christian walk. That if we, if we don't pray, we don't have much walk with God. You can read the Bible until you're blue in the face. But if you never spend any time praying, it's hard to take the application of that spiritual truth and put it into your life. There is spiritual life that occurs when we pray. And we need to get that working in our life. And I believe that for most believers, they feel Jesus calling them to live a life of prayer. They just don't know how to figure it out. It's interesting as you look at the life of Jesus and his time with the disciples. The disciples saw Jesus do incredible things. They saw him raise the dead. They saw him speak to a, a, a person who was lame and they could walk, a person who was blind and they could see. They saw him feed thousands of people with, with hardly any resources at all. And yet, what was the one thing they asked him? They said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. He had an amazing, amazing prayer life. And Jesus desires us to have that same prayer life. He desires us to be a house of prayer. Do you remember that story? It's found in Matthew uh, 21, where Jesus goes to the temple one day, and he, when he gets there, he sees that, that, that church is certainly different than what he's expecting. You got people buying and selling stuff. It's kind of turned into the, a local craft fair. You know, they're, they're selling doves and selling this and selling that and changing money and ripping people off, and, and he really loses it and, and turns over the table, drives out the people. In fact, look at this scripture. In Matthew 21, he says, And Jesus entered the temple and drove out those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of what? Prayer. But you've made it, uh, but you are making it a robber's den. My house is to be a house of prayer. Now, if you're not careful, you will think that Jesus is referring to this being a house of prayer. There's nothing wrong with that. But you understand this is just a building, right? You understand that, right? There's nothing holy about this. Nothing special about this. It's just a building. It only becomes the church when what? We gather together in it. It's just a building all the rest of the time. And now here's an interesting other turn to this. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says this. Do you not know that you are the temple of God? And the Spirit of God dwells in you. 
Now make this connection. Jesus says, my house, the temple should be a house of prayer. And Paul says, you are the temple. So what does that mean your life should be? A house of prayer. God calls you to be a person of prayer. He's called every believer to be a person of prayer. And, and, and I think there's a yearning and a longing in each one of us to be a people who know how to connect with God. But for most of us, that's a difficult thing. And let me give you a little five things to just kind of hang your hat on when it comes to our, our prayer life and, and how it should work, how to make that hard thing a lot easier. When all is said and done, look at this. The four... Uh, go back two, I think. One more there. Well, it's gone. There was one in there. Let me just read it to you then. It says this. Prayer is first and foremost a conversation between you and God. Everything else about prayer falls right into that category. When all said and done, prayer is simply a conversation between you and God. In God. Now, we try to make prayer complicated and sophisticated, but God says it's just a conversation. How easy is it to have a conversation? If you and I were to talk after church today, we could have a conversation, right? You'd say, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. And we might keep it on the surface, and then as we got to know each other, we'd have a deeper conversation. We'd get to know each other, begin to ask questions. That's what prayer is. It's having that conversation with God, it is the primary thing. It's just a conversation. Now, let me give you these five things. The first one is this, and this is the biggie. This is the biggest one of all. If we could get past this one item when it comes to our prayer life, 90% of our problems would go away, and it's this. Forget about performance. For so many of us, we've made prayer a performance. We're worried about are we doing it right are we doing it wrong? Are we saying the right words? Are we saying the wrong words? Am I, am I, am I making, this, uh, making this work? The main thing is that we don't worry about the performance. We try to make it spiritual. Anybody ever heard somebody trying to pray in a spiritual way? Or maybe you know some people who are that way. Oh, God, we pray that thou wouldst open the doors of heaven and bless this people. As we... How many people talk that way? Nobody, right? You understand God does not speak King James English, right? You don't have to say, oh, thou, holy one. It's, it's just, it's, it's your father. It's a conversation. It's not about performance. You don't have to make it sound spiritual because God is the one listening. I love a story told of, of a former, of former President uh, Johnson when he was in office. They had a prayer breakfast at the White House. And the pastor stood up to, pr to pray. And when he finished, President uh, uh, Johnson said, Pastor, you need to speak up when you pray. I couldn't hear you. And the pastor said, I wasn't speaking to you. I mean, see, see when we pray, we're not be praying for anybody else. In fact, if you're praying for other people so they can hear you and be impressed, guess what? It ain't prayer. It's just some egotistical talk. And so often, we try to make prayer a performance. It's not about performance. It's not about sounding spiritual. Most of us learn how to pray by listening to others. We listen to other pray, people pray, and then we, we copy them. And sometimes we pick up some bad habits along the way. Uh, one of my favorite one, and, and I know several people who are guilty of this, is, is, is to use the word just. You know anybody who prays that way? Lord, we just want to bless you. Bless you. Just be with us. And I just pray that my heart is close to you. Just keep us close. It's kind of like that guy on the low band of the radio stations uh, that, are the, that are the online preachers. Anybody hear of those as you pass through them? They're just, hallelujah, God loves you, praise Jesus, God, we love you, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah, amen. And you're like, can you say just a phrase without 15 hallelujahs and amens in it? Some people pray that, think, think, think it makes them sound more spiritual or that God's gonna listen better. God already knows your heart. Sometimes we think if I can just get the right phrase, if I can just say the right thing, then God will have to answer my prayer. I Googled uh, in, on Amazon. Yeah, I guess you can't Google on Amazon. You can just look in Amazon. I was on Amazon yesterday, and I did a search for answered prayer. Here's three different, uh, three different titles I came across. See if these 
bring anything that seemed to me maybe a little bit of a question. First title was this, 100% answered prayers. How to leave your prayer, for, uh, prayer room full of answers. Number two was answer, answered prayers guaranteed. Number three, power to pray once and receive answers. All those are saying, if you follow this pattern, if you pray this way, God has to answer your prayer. You understand, God doesn't have to do anything, right? Because he's what? He's God. Now, God will answer our prayers. He does answer our prayers. But God is not, he's not, uh, it's not like a prayer. is not like rubbing Aladdin's lamp and God's going to show up and give you your three wishes, Right? It's not getting it right. It's about having a conversation with God. God's not looking for you to say that exact phrase, and once you say it, he can go, good. Once you said that, I can answer your prayer. A few years ago, we were putting, in, uh, uh, putting together an office, and we were trying to get the Internet uh, up and running. Uh, we worked with, the, with ATT, and, um, and they had uh, two, different pla- two different ways. They could send a tech person out for about $300, or they had a DYI thing that they would send you the equipment, you follow the instructions, and do it yourself. Well, I have to tell you, I am cheap, okay? I am cheap, so guess what I did? I did the DIY, and I got the box, and I got the router, and all those things, and I hooked them all up, followed the instructions just exactly, turned it all on, hooked up my computer, and guess what? No internet. So I went back, followed the instructions again, did exactly what they said, checked all the cords, checked all the connections, made sure it was right, turned on my computer, and no internet. So I did what we all do. I called tech support, right? Three hours later, after being on hold, I talked to somebody, and they gave me some instructions. I go and make some changes, do all that. Guess what? No internet. This goes on for like two and a half days. I feel like I know the people at tech support by name, right? Finally, I'm talking to this person out of frustration. I said, listen, if we can't get this working, I'm just done. And the the lady said, so, sir, are you saying that if we can't resolve this problem, you're wanting to close your account? And she said it very specifically. I don't remember the exact phrase, but that was it. And I kind of listened to it. And then she said, "Let let me say it again, sir. Are you telling me that if we cannot resolve this issue, you want to close your account? And I said, Yes, I am. And she said, well, now that you've said that, I can offer a tech support person to come out for free. Well, then I was really ticked off, right? (laughs) All that wasted time. You know, when it comes to our prayer, sometimes we, we feel like that's what we have to do. That God's waiting for us to get that exact phrase, that just right way of praying, and then he's gonna answer. Prayer is first and foremost a conversation with God. He's not looking for you to do it right. He's looking to have a conversation with you. God is not waiting for you to say that magical spiritual phrase so he can answer your prayer. Actually, God blesses simple, honest prayers. Simple, honest praying. That's what God wants. He wants you to come before him simply and honestly. No show. You don't have to impress God because you know what? He already knows you. If you're mad, guess what? He knows you're mad. If you're having a rough day, he knows you're having a rough day. You don't have to act spiritual and then bring it up. You can come right in and go, God, I am having such a bad day. You can say, I am so mad at my wife. Or probably the other way around. Your wife's mad at you. You I'm so mad at my husband. You, you, you can be honest in your praying. You don't have to put on a false front. You don't have to put on a false front like we do on the phone. Does that ever happen at your house? You kids get in here and clean this kitchen up. It's hard. Oh, hi. How are you? It's so nice to talk with you. Right? We're that way. <laughs> a few years ago, I was pastoring a church. We had a guy who ran a used car. He ran a used car lot. I called him one day. We're getting ready to go to lunch together, and I called him. And, and have you ever picked up the phone and still be talking? Well, that's what he was doing. So he picked up the phone. You tell that things pastors can't say. I mean, just went a whole string of it. And then goes, hello? And they go, hey, this is Brother Billy. How you doing? Finally, he goes, well, this is awkward, <laughs> right? God knows your heart. He knows where you are. 
You don't have to put on something fancy. Just talk with the Father. Look in Luke 18. Jesus tells a story about two people coming before God in prayer. And, and look what he says. There was a Pharisee. A Pharisee was one of the teachers, one of the spiritual leaders of the day. There was a Pharisee stood and was praying to him, praying to this himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a day. I pay tithe on all I get. But the tax collector, who was just a little ways away, but the tax collector standing some distance away was even unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven, but he was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Jesus says this, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus is saying there's two guys come to pray. And one guy is, God, aren't you proud of me? I am your one man. I am the guy you can depend on. I'm not like that slime bag over there. The other guy is saying, God, just, I, I know I'm worthless. Just be merciful on me. I'm just being honest, God. I, I mess up. Jesus says, one of them left with the answer and one of them didn't. Are you with me? You don't have to put on a fancy approach. It's not about how you perform before God. It's about having a conversation with him. Number two is this. We got to remember who we are and whose we are. Who we are and whose we are. You are more than a sinner saved by grace. Are you with me? You're more than a sinner saved by grace. You are a child of the living God. You are a saint in the kingdom of God. You're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. When you come into God's presence, you come as his child. And relationship brings about access. You come in as his child. You don't come in as someone, some poor beggar. You come in as his child before him. Back when uh, John F. Kennedy was, past, was, was uh, president of the United States, the story is told of an individual who runs through the White House, right past the guards and bursts into the Oval Office and runs straight toward the president and no one stops that person. Do you know why? President Kennedy had a child, Catherine, in the White House. And his little girl ran past the guards. Did they stop her? Nope. She burst into the Oval Office. Nobody stopped her. She runs right to the president, jumps in his lap, and no one stopped her because of the relationship. Now, just to let you know, I wouldn't try that yourself. Don't go running through the White House. Probably not going to end up successful, right? If I came running, through, running toward the uh, Oval Office, I wouldn't go past those guards. They would have me on the ground facing the carpet, right? But because of the relationship, she could go anywhere she wanted to. Here's what I'm telling you. Because of the relationship you have with God, you don't have to come in as a beggar. You come in before him as a child. You come before him as a child. Look what Jesus said in John 15. No longer do I call you slaves, for slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Jesus doesn't call you a slave. You're not a slave of God. You're a child of God. You're a friend of God. And he welcomes you into his presence. Look at Hebrews 4, 16. I love this verse because it says, Therefore let us draw with confidence into the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and grace in the time of need. Because we're his children, you can walk boldly into the presence of God, into his throne room in prayer. You don't have to come begging and just pray. Oh, you can come in as a child. And let me tell you what, after having three children, children don't beg for their parents for their needs. Anybody got kids? They don't do a lot of begging, even when they grow up. My kids, so my youngest one's 25 right now. Her birthday is January 1st. She told me last night that she had bought a, um, gosh, a, for a Nintendo, somebody help me here, a Nintendo Switch. And she told me what my percentage of the, of the toy was for her birthday, right? <laughs> and you're like, really? Anybody have children? They don't come before you and go, oh, 
great Father, we praise you and we love you. Great is your magnificence as our Father. Oh, thank you for providing for us and going to work. And if it would be possible, could we please have 20 bucks? Right? No, what do they do? Dad, I need $20. I need this. I need that. They don't beg us because relationship gives them access. And as a father, I want to bless my children. What did I do? I said, yes, ma'am, I'll Vimeo Vimeo you the money, (laughs) right? We want to bless our children. God wants to bless you. When you come into his presence, he invites you to come boldly and to bring your needs before him and experience his grace working in your life. Some of us come before God like beggars and strangers. God invites you to come into his presence. You know, I, I, I spend most of my time uh, producing a show called The Daily Promise. It's an online uh, blog and uh, podcast. And we, we spend three, day, uh, three minutes, three to four minutes, five days a week, looking at one of the promises of God. You know there are over 3,500 promises in God's word? 3,500 promises. In fact, every one of God's commands is a promise. If God tells you to um, enter his, well, whatever that, let's see, how about um, God calls us to share his love, right? If he's called you, he, is, he empowers you to accomplish what he calls you to be. If he calls you to live a holy life, he is empowering you to do that. Here's a promise with every command. And there's over 3,500 promises in God's word. And so on the daily promise, we focus on one promise every day, and it goes out to people around the world. Now, I say all that to say this. The more you know of the promises of God, the more confident you can come into his presence and receive what you need. It's not about performance. It's about understanding the relationship we have between you and your Father. Number three is this. We need to remember that when you pray, you're entering into spiritual battle. You understand everything you see is not all there is. There there is the physical world that we see and the spiritual realm. And the spiritual realm has authority over the physical world. And when you pray, you enter into the spiritual realm. You begin to affect the spiritual realm. Because that's where the Holy Spirit, that's where the Lord lives. That's where the, the presence of God is. And when you pray, listen, you're entering and you're releasing the power of heaven, but you're also heard in hell. There's a battle to keep you from praying. Some of the times we have difficulties in our prayer because, God's, because Satan is working against us, and we need to understand that. But there is spiritual power when you pray. Now, I'm not talking about some law of attraction, new age thinking. I'm talking about when you pray, you release the powers of heaven into people's lives. You can pray for someone here in the United States, in India, and know that that prayer is being answered in a moment. It's like releasing a spiritual cruise missile when you pray for someone. Oh, you got friends that, you know, there have been times in, that, uh, that I know of where we've prayed for a need for someone, maybe in another part of the country, and find out that that need was answered that very moment. There is spiritual power release. We also have to understand that there are spiritual powers working against us. The good news is we are still victorious in Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Let me finish up with these last couple because we, uh, we, we need to finish up. Um, when it comes to the spiritual power, let me just give you this verse. You, most of you know it. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against world forces of darkness, against spiritual forces, wickedness in heavenly places. What I'm trying to get you to understand when it comes to spiritual uh, battle is this. When you pray, God is listening and hell is listening. And, and the spiritual forces of darkness will do everything they can to keep you from praying. And the powers of, of, of the kingdom of God are doing everything they can to, to keep you praying. And when you pray, things happen. Let me just get you to understand this. When we pray so often, we pray thinking this way. What I can see, what I can't see. But oftentimes when we pray, things begin to be put into motion God begins to work in people's lives. I have a friend who prayed. Uh, we were at the church, at his church a few years ago, or went to the church he was at a few years ago. 
to see his son-in-law baptized. He had been praying for his son-in-law for 18 years. I don't know about you, but I'd have given up after that much time. But he kept praying and claiming God's promises in that guy's life. And God continued to work in that young man's life until he broke through and the guy gave his heart to Christ. There are spiritual forces that are at work, and sometimes we don't see them happen immediately. It takes a, few mo- it takes a while before it comes to pass. Does that make sense? But there's a spiritual battle. Number four is this. We need to listen when we pray. Prayer is not always about talking. For the longest, I thought prayer was, I need to be talking. No, actually, I need to spend about half the time talking and half the time listening. If we're going to have a conversation, who has to speak? Both parties, right? <laughs> Ever been to the grocery store and you see someone you haven't seen in a long time? And they, you have a conversation with them, but you don't get to talk? Are you with me? They start telling you about the kids and this and that and all that they've gone through. And then they say, oh, I've got to go. It's been so good talking to you. And you want to go, well, it's been so good listening to you. <laughs> right? Sometimes we pray that way. We come in like, <clears throat> we come in like, uh, like kids do at Santa Claus at the mall. We hop up in God's lap. We give them our list. I want this. I need this. I want this. I need this. I want this. I need this. Love you. Bye. We don't even get a picture. And we're gone. God, speak to me, and then we never give him time to speak to us. One of the things I've begun to learn in my own prayer life over the last couple of years is to take time to listen. If we believe that God wants to speak to us, we need to listen for his voice. And God doesn't yell, and he doesn't shout. Most of the time, he speaks in a quiet, still voice. In fact, if the Holy Spirit resides in your spirit, wouldn't it make sense that God would speak to your spirit? I've never heard God speak to me audibly. I wouldn't be opposed to it, but I've never heard him. He's never burned anything in our front yard, you know, like with a message. But I'm absolutely confident I've heard his voice in my heart and in my spirit. There's a story told of, of, um, <clears throat> of Elisha in the Old Testament. He was, he was kind of experiencing some depression and he was going through some struggles and, um, and God says, I'm going to take you to the mountain and I'm going to speak to you. So he takes him up to the mountain and a giant wind comes blowing through, knocking over trees. I mean, it's like hurricane force winds. And then an earthquake comes and the ground shakes. And then a fire comes. And finally, a still, fall, a still voice speaks. And, and God says this, In 1 Kings 19, it says, And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. The Lord was not in the earthquake. It was not in the wind. He was not in the big stuff. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. God speaks to you in a whisper when you listen. Before my dad died, his voice really got very, very weak. And I would take him to lunch. And we'd go to, <clears throat> he, he loved Texas land and cattle when that was around. And we'd go there, but I had to sit directly in front of him so I could see his face, and I had to concentrate 100% because he spoke very softly. And in a noisy restaurant, you had to concentrate and read his lips and really listen to what he had to say. You're not going to hear God by just going, God, speak to me. Okay, I got to go. If you want to hear from God, you got to take some time, quiet before him, and allow him to speak. You got to tune your ear spiritual heart to him does that make sense and you don't have to talk all the time sometimes the best time of prayer is just to sit quietly before the lord and allow him to speak to you god wants to say things to you but we get so busy and so caught up with so many things and that that leads me to the last one is this we need to be still and know him you can never know god in a busy, in a, through a busy life you know, we've made busyness a, um, a, a badge of honor, haven't we? When's the last, when you ask someone, how are you doing? What are they, 90% they're going to say, I've been really, I've been so busy. Even over the holidays, she talks, oh man, I'm so busy. I had so much I had to do. Yesterday I had to do this. I had to do When's the last time you talked to them and said, how are you doing? And they go, you know, I am doing so good. I haven't done anything in weeks. I've been kicked back. I'm taking it easy, man. I'm just relaxing. This is the best time of my life. You, you would think, what is wrong with you, buddy? The rest of us are going crazy busy. You should be busy too. No, sometimes we need to back off and just relax a bit. We need to be.
Be still. The psalmist said this in Psalm 46. Be still and what? Know that I'm God. He didn't stay, say, busy. He said, be still. Be still and know that I'm God. That is hard for guys like me and, and some of y'all. I like to be busy. I am not a sit before the TV for hours at a time. I'm not, a, I, I've always got something I'm wanting to be doing. I've got 14 projects I want to accomplish before I die, right? I'm not a, I'm not a quiet before God, but if we're going to learn from him, we have to be quiet. We have to listen. Jesus said in Matthew 6, but when you pray, go into your inner room, close the door, and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who is in secret uh, sees what is done in secret and will reward you. My mom raised two boys, two rowdy, rowdy boys. And she was an extremely godly woman. Every day she would lock herself in her bathroom with her Bible just to get away from us to have a time of prayer and Bible study. <laughs> the only, only quiet place she could find in our house was her bathroom. Got to get away, right? You need to get away. You need to get away for a few moments every day to spend some time with the Lord. Maybe you have to lock yourself in the bathroom. Maybe you have to go out in the backyard. Maybe you have to put on your, 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 your AirPods in and put it on noise cancellation and just listen to the Lord. But you need to get away. You need to close the door. One of the ways you can close the door is to not have this with you. Do you know that Google says... The average person has their phone near, within hand's reach 23 hours and 20 minutes a day. Do you know the only time you don't, most people don't have their phone within arm's reach? When they're in the shower. That's actually correct. We're really addicted. To these. I'm not, believe me, I'm just as addicted as everybody else. But when you're having your, your time with the Lord, you need to set this aside. Uh, I recommend you don't, you, don't, you don't have your time with the Lord and read, it, read your Bible off your app. Because if you're like me, you're going to get a notification. And there it goes. We need, to be, we need to be closing the door to the world and saying, God, I want to hear you. God, I want to talk with you. And tell God what's on your heart. Tell him what's on your heart. Quiet your spirit before him. Let him know what's on your heart and then stop and listen for his voice. Listen to what he has to say for you. What would happen in your Christian life today if over the next few weeks you just spent five minutes a day with the Lord? Just quietly before him. God, I want to talk to you. Would you talk to me? Do you think it would transform your life? It would be amazing. For most of us, if we did it consistently, it would be amazing. I'm not asking, I'm not suggesting you do an hour. Most of us, that's not, even, that's not even possible. But five minutes we could do. Isn't it amazing how quickly a sitcom, a 30-minute sitcom goes by and how long prayer time is? It's all right. Just take a couple of minutes. Start, start where you are. If you can do five minutes, do five minutes. Just four minutes. You don't have to talk through the whole time. Just pray, tell him what God's on your heart, and then listen to what he has to say to you. Might even want to take a notebook. You can write that down. Write, write, write on what you hear. Take a few moments and listen. Forget about performing. Forget about doing it right. Just say, God, hey, we're trying this. Remember when you were dating, how bad you were at it? Anybody been on a bad date? Liars? I didn't say, you don't have to admit you were, you were the bad date. <laughs> Some of us were in that case, right? Early on, early on, you have a hard time communicating. You ever been on one of those dates where you're like, how's your day? Good. What do you do today? Nothing. All right, you're killing me, girl, right? But after a while, you start to get to know each other and you begin to have a conversation, right? And then the longer you know someone, the deeper that conversation can be. Hey, First and foremost, prayer is a conversation between you and God, right? Let me just encourage you today. Most of us struggle in our prayer life. One, it, it's okay. We all do. Second is forget about, the, forget about the performance. Remember that you're his child. Close the door and be quiet before him and listen for his voice. I promise you, if you begin doing those things, your, your prayer life will be transformed. Let me give you a couple of resources that we do. Uh, 
well, I mentioned it earlier. I have the Daily Promise. It's not a commercial cause for me because it's free. You know, we don't charge for any of these. But uh, if you'd like to start your day off with a positive word from God as opposed to a negative word from CNN, uh, if you subscribe to the Daily Promise every morning, I'll send you a three-minute, three-minute reminder that you can listen to or read about a promise from God's word. Start your day positive. Guys, Praying for her will take will teach you how to pray for your wife over 31 days. I'll send you a little reminder every morning. Here's what you can pray for your wife today. Here's a promise you can claim for her. Ladies, same thing for you. And I promise as you begin to implement prayer as part of your walk with God, you'll find a whole new level of fulfillment and, and joy in your walk with him. Let me invite you to pray. Let me invite you to close your eyes for just a moment. What's the one thing the one thing during our time this morning that God seemed to speak to you. Maybe it was an application. Maybe it was one of these five things that you thought, oh boy, that's me. Take just a moment and just think about that. How could you, how could you, how can you apply that into your life? Lord Jesus, <clears throat> Father, I pray that you would make us into a people of prayer. Lord, I pray that I can be a house of prayer. That each one of us can be houses of prayer. Lord, we know you want to speak to us and you want to hear from us far more than we often want to speak or hear from you. So Lord, give us a new hunger. Lord, I pray for each person here this morning. God, I pray that you would give them a hunger for your presence and to spend time with you, Lord. God, I pray that you'd bring a new fulfillment and joy in their prayer. Lord, I pray for that person here this morning who may be struggling with some issues that maybe no one else knows about. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come and minister to them in this place. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, thank you that you've invited us to come boldly into your presence. We give you praise, glory, and honor in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I'm so glad you were here with us this morning. Royal will be back next week. It's been a joy to be with you. I think we have some announcements before we close the service.